First, I want to thank you all for coming and honoring our invitation uh, to what I think is going to be a very historic uh, afternoon, uh, where we're going to really discuss uh, and try to agree on uh, the issue of healthcare infrastructure in Africa. And uh, I know you all have followed uh, what goes on in Africa over the last uh, several years since the HIV AIDS pandemic, uh, since the Ebola crisis last summer. And what we've seen is that uh, Africa is totally exposed uh, when it comes to healthcare. And so what we have decided as a constituency for Africa, we decided that we're going to stop this. We're going to decide we're going to do something about it. And what we want to do is to really forge a coalition that's going to really make the world respond to Africa in a way that Africa could to partner with Africa to build the necessary healthcare infrastructure that will sustain lives on the continent. Um, to start the program, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to have uh, Abiodon Koya, who is a well-known uh, opera singer, uh, just got back from Nigeria, and uh, I asked her to come to open the program up with a song. Uh, so, uh, Abi, you're here? Ah, please. She's, uh, to me, the most dynamic singer on the continent. And the first time I heard her, she almost blows you away because you don't, Think she's going to come in that direction uh, but uh, uh, so I really just got back from Nigeria so she got a lot of the spirit in her and uh, so uh, without further ado I'll be good afternoon how are you I bring you greetings from the motherland I was in Nigeria for about two months and I just got back and I'm going back again next month I live in Atlanta and I have a wonderful friend of mine. His name is Jose Sassin. He's a famous international opera singer, and we've been very good friends. And uh, and I've asked him to join me and just accompany me. And we have just a special treat for you. Yeah, please enjoy. It's a, it's a kind of prayer for everyone in here and for the continent of Africa. Please enjoy and hum along if you know Amazing Grace. <laughs>
melting grace, how sweet the sound, the safe, a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now. Thank you. Thank you, Melvin. Okay, I now want to call on uh, Tarak Ben Yusuf, who is here to represent. He's a senior political officer for the African Union mission here in Washington, and he's here to represent Ambassador Amina Saloum Ali, uh, who got who's, who has to remain in Addis after the AU summit, and but he's bringing the message. Uh, we're the, we're in the Africa Union House, you know. This is the Africa Union's house uh, here in Washington. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a house for the diaspora, it's a house for Africa. And so I'm always thrilled to be here. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me uh, ask Rick to, to give the message. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Her Excellency Ambassador Amin Ali, permanent representative of the African Union Mission to the U.S., I would like to extend to each one of you a warm welcome at Africa's house. And thank you for responding to the kind invitation of my brother, Mr. Melvin Foot, President of Constitu Constituency for Africa, to participate in this important and timely forum on healthcare infrastructure in Africa. Allow me to take this opportunity to thank, to thank Mr. Melfoot for this initiative and for all his excellent work dedicated to the development of Africa. I want also to commend all the institutions participating in today's forum for their active leadership in the promotion of the global health and development in Africa. My special thanks go to our keynote speaker today, Mr. Jeffrey Wright. Thank you, Mr. Wright, for your service and for your commitment to humanitarian causes in Africa and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, health is a fundamental human right. It is also at the center of national security of every country. Health, in its broader sense, is about everything that development stands for. So investing in health, and particularly in women's and children's health, is critical to directly improving people's lives. In this regard, an investment in economic development as well. There is an increasing recognition that health creates wealth and advances GDP. Between 2000 and 2011, about 24% of the growth in full income in developing countries resulted from improvement in health, as recently underscored by the president of the World Bank at Georgetown University in his lectures on Ebola. As the old adage says, health is wealth and investment in health is the right thing to do morally, but also economically. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa has made significant strides in various areas of social and human development. The continent has the potential to achieve more if it can overcome the large burden of disease, due largely to the scores of a plethora of communicable and infectious disease, which continue to be a barrier to faster development. Challenges still remain in addressing disease prevention and control, such as limited infrastructure and the human capacities, weak disease surveillance and laboratory investigation services, as well as delayed and inadequate preparedness to respond to health emergencies and disasters. Although Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, 
which makes um, up 11% of the world population and 24% of the world's disease burden, it accounts for less than 1% of global health expenditure. Given the demands on government budget, public sector funding has been limited. Donor funding as well has been cyclical, driven by economic condition in donor country, rather than the strategic importance of healthcare sector. The Ebola outbreak described it as one of the greatest challenges that Africa has faced in the last decade by the chairperson of the African Union recently at the summit has underlined the need for action and is providing a new momentum to invest in health institutional framework and capacities which one has to admit remain fragile. Our gathering today, ladies and gentlemen, is taking place right after the 24th summit of the African Union. As you all know, we are proclaiming this year as the year of women, empowerment and development towards Africa Agenda 2063. Because of the urgent need to address the issues relating to the status of women in Africa and the critical role women can play in the survival and development of our continent. Health has become at the forefront of efforts to advance women's rights and equality as women not only bear the greatest disease burden, but are also the primary caregivers. I want to share with you two important decisions related to health adopted by the recent summit. On first, on the Ebola virus disease outbreak, the Assembly of Heads of States and Government recommended the extension of the mandate of the African Union support to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. The summit called upon member states who have not yet done so to lift all the restrictions imposed on Ebola affected country and also requested the international financial institutions and partner countries to cancel the debt of the three affected countries, Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone. The summit also approved the recommendation to urgently convene a global conference on the Ebola epidemic. Requested the Commission, the African Union Commission to liaison with all stakeholders in this regard and appealed to the scientific community to accelerate the search for a vaccine against Ebola. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Ebola outbreak, as I said, has provided the impetus to speed up also the establishment of the African Center for Disease Control and Prevention. As you know, the center will conduct life-saving research on priority health problems in Africa and to serve as a platform to share knowledge and build capacity in responding to public health emergency and threats. So on the establishment of the African Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the Assembly of Heads of State and government decide, expressed satisfaction for the effort made by the Commission, the African Union Commission, to speed up the process of the establishment of the center by mid-2015. Approved the coordination office should initially be at the headquarters of the African Union in Addis Ababa and authorized the Commission to undertake the mobilization of funds from member states, development partners, and the private sector, who have already indicated an interest and who have also experience in this domain. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to emphasize uh, here the prominent role played by the African Union in the fight against Ebola. For the first time, and under the leadership of Dr. Kosazana Dlamini Zuma, the chairperson of the African Union Commission, the African Union mobilized its member country, and today we have 835 healthcare workers from African country deployed in the affected country. In addition, and again for the first time, the African Union organized an African business round table on Ebola with African private sector to fight the Ebola epidemic in West Africa at the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa. This was the first wave of pledging and 32 million US dollars 
were raised from the private sector and the African Development Bank. The Africa Against Ebola SMS campaign was launched in Lagos on the 3rd of December through the collaboration between the AIF, African Union Commission, mobile telephone operators and regulators. It is now possible for anyone in about 42 participating countries to contribute $1 simply by sending Stop Ebola to a common short SMS code applicable in the, if they are in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, mobilizing all the segments of the Union, the African Union cannot forget its important part, the diaspora. The African Union has been working with the diaspora on all its programs for the development of the continent. Therefore, our event today is another eloquent testimony of the working partnership collaboration between the AU and the diaspora. In this noble undertaking, the diaspora is an important lever and a key associate. You are partners of choice for the knowledge and the web of network you possess and the leads you can provide in helping Africa build and strengthen the capacity of its health services and meet the challenges not only of Ebola, but of the weakness in the healthcare system in Africa. Indeed, today's forum goes beyond the fight of Ebola. It is about building healthcare infrastructure, soft and hard. It is a long-term undertaking that calls our collective effort. The African Union has the necessary framework in place, such as the Africa Health Strategy and the Abuja Call for accelerated action toward universal access to HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria services in Africa. The AU mission would like, in this regard, and at the end, to pay a sincere tribute to all governments, international organizations, institutions, and NGOs, and the business community that have been at the front line for meeting the challenges of Ebola. A special thank you goes to the United States of America for leading the efforts in the fight against Ebola, to President Obama and his administration, the U.S. Congress, to members of Congress, Republican and Democrat, and to the American people for their generosity. Thank you for your presence and for your active solidarity. God bless you all. Thank you. I now want to call on Dr. Roscoe Moore, who is the interim chairman for the constituency for Africa. Dr. Moore is also the former Assistant, Sec Assistant Surgeon General uh, under the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, he's a tremendous expert in, in health, uh, and he's my boss. So without further ado, uh, Your Excellency, Dr. Roscoe Moore. Yeah, for Mel, I'm, I'm his interim boss. <laughs> yes, I want to welcome everyone here. Moscow Morris, you just stated. I served under uh, Bush 41, the Clinton years, and Bush 43. And my mission was to, to have joint programs between Health and Human Services and USCID. And we built coalition and produced 40 HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis programs in 40 African countries. Twelve of those were chosen to be the first countries in Africa to be a part of the PETFOP program, the President's Emergency Plan for HIV and AIDS. Ebola is the issue at hand. While HIV AIDS is still rampant on the continent, we must understand this, that a lot of people still don't know. People think it's a joke. People don't understand that Africa is a continent. It's not a country. And the analogy would be the 50 states within the United States. We have our own issues here. By where you're born in a particular state determines your health care status. So while we're here to, to talk about co cooperating and collaborating with African countries, we're not here to, to point fingers and to badmouth governments and those things. Everybody needs to be lifted, and we need to cooperate and collaborate and not help and assist. 
You need to build the infrastructure within the African country <laughs> so they can manage their own affairs. So we, we're not here to talk about corruption and those things. Because we have enough jails in the United States that are full. So when people talk about Africa, it's always some negative thing. But we don't talk about negative stuff. Things exist. Uh, people do bad things, and they go to jail. So there you are. So Mel? No. Yes. Thank you. OK. Um, we're now at the point of our keynote address. Let me talk about Jeffrey C. Wright first. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a movie buff. I go to all the movies. And uh, I, uh, you know, when I think about a prolific, uh, uh, you know, a prolific actor, uh, the word prolific does not register with Jeffrey Wright. Uh, when you look at the, the body of his work, uh, what this man has accomplished, uh, he's a young man. He's not that old, you know. I'm thinking Sidney Poitier and... And Harry Belafonte and Danny Glover, and, uh, but you look at the body of his work and uh, his movie. All of us got movies that we we are our favorite. And, you know, I don't know if you guys have been watching uh, Boardwalk Empire or The Hunger Project or Casino Royale or The Manchurian Candidate, Ali, Shaft. You know, uh, gosh, uh, Angels in America. You know, I think. Uh, is one of the best movies ever uh, to come out. But crossing theater, uh, the, the silver screen, the small screen, uh, and plus, he's a nice guy. And not only is he an actor, he's a social entrepreneur. He cares about the people. He has an investment company doing mining in Sierra Leone. Uh, he cares about Africa. He cares about African people. He's a great father. He just do everything. I think he got a big S on his chest. <laughs> Superman, was that one of your movies? No. <laughs> Leave that to you, Bill. <laughs> but uh, I think we're, we're blessed uh, to have uh, Jeffrey Wright uh, as our keynote speaker. The subject matter is dear to his heart. Um, he's watched what goes on in Africa. He's close to Sierra Leone. He's seen what has gone on over this past year. Um, and so without further ado, will you all please rise and welcome to the podium our keynote speaker, Jeffrey Wright. I want to get the energy right. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, Mel. Boy, a lot to live up to there. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks to the constituency for Africa for inviting me and, and to the African Union for, uh, for hosting uh, this today. Um, yes, uh, for those of you who, who haven't seen Boardwalk Empire, I, I play a gentleman named Dr. Narcisse, which probably doesn't qualify me to talk about uh, microbiology and, uh, and uh, epidemiology, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my hand nonetheless. Um, uh, and some of you may uh, have, have heard some of these remarks, Ambassador Stevens, it's great to see you here. Uh, and others. Uh, I spoke a couple of weeks ago at the Capitol, and um, Mel told me, he said, don't change a word. He says, just say exactly what you said, don't change a word. So uh, I, I, I listened to him to an extent. But um, uh, Albert Einstein wasn't an actor, uh, but he was pretty clever. And uh, of course, it was Einstein who said, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. I first traveled to Sierra Leone in May 2001 during a ceasefire in the country's decade-long rebel war. 17,000 UN troops and personnel had deployed to the country by then, along with an army of NGOs and foreign agencies, medical and otherwise. Sierra Leone's war was officially declared over in 2002, and in the latter half of 2003, following the end of hostilities in neighboring Liberia, a deployment by the international community of similar magnitude to that in Sierra Leone began in that country. Many hundreds of millions of dollars were expended, along with countless hours of heroic effort and labor by legions of talented, well-intentioned well people from all over the world. And yet, roughly 10 years later, here we are again. Despite all of those resources, all of that work geared toward peace and nation building, the Mano River Union of Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, which also recently emerged from civil unrest, 
remain dangerously vulnerable to a health crisis like Ebola virus disease. Healthcare delivery systems remained as frail as any in the world, and during that recovery period, not one new modern hospital was built. And so again, the region has been sent reeling from the effects of war, a war fought this time against the merciless microscopic enemy. The social fabric of these countries, again, rented from untimely deaths, orphaned children, closed schools, many shut down businesses, but not those that feed on crisis and devastated economies. The international community was seriously late, but ultimately has done reasonably well in assisting Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone in fending off the Ebola enemy. There are now indicators that the worst seems, in fact, to be over. But in too many ways, today's international response resembles that of 10 or so years ago. Are we now expecting a different long-term outcome to be born of the current efforts? Would Einstein call us insane? Or perhaps the international community expects the same outcome as before, only to contain the crisis without a view toward, toward long-term health care system strengthening and to gear up for another heroic return at some point in the future to fend off the next unforeseen health threat. Health threat. Foreign agencies doubtless will be better prepared next time. An end of the year New York Times Ebola report went into great detail on the missteps made by foreign first responder groups and the virus hunters in reacting early and consistently to snuff out the current outbreak and lessons learned to be applied toward what the Times seemed to suggest was another inevitable future pandemic. Little to no emphasis was placed on the fact that the responsibility for the well-being of the citizens of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone primarily, though admittedly not entirely, lies with the respective governments of those countries. And little acceptance uh, was evident in the times of these words from Dr. Larry Brilliant, head of the Skoll Foundation's Global Threats Fund and famous for helping eradicate smallpox almost 40 years ago, outbreaks are in inevitable, pandemics are optional. Still, sanity may win out just yet. Ambassador Martin Sajik, president of the United Nations Economic and Social Council, yesterday wrote in uh, USA and uh, US uh, uh, and World uh, Report opinion piece, uh, stressing something closer to regional preparedness, saying that the fact that the African Union is setting up a center for disease control and prevention is commendable and developed countries should support it generously to assist the region in reducing their communicable disease burden. We must provide the necessary technical assistance and capacity building to make sure it's equipped with the latest technologies necessary to respond effectively to the Ebola outbreak or any other pandemic in the future. Now, I was upstairs and uh, I was introduced as being the keynote speaker for, uh, for, for today, and, 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 and the woman who was sitting there said, oh, oh have you been to Africa? <laughs> um, so I think it may be useful uh, if I provide a little uh, more context on my, uh, you know, what, 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 what brings me here personally. Um, uh, since that first trip 13 years ago, I've traveled to Sierra Leone uh, at least uh, 20 occasions, spending much of my time there in the country's eastern Kailan district, uh, in 2003, with two retired senior officers from the U.S. Army, one, one of whom lived in the region for two years post-retirement, I co-founded a gold exploration and mining company, Taya, toward building a natural resource-driven development model in partnership with a community called Penguia Chieftain. Penguia lies about 40 miles west across the Guinea-Sierra Leone border from Meliandu, the Guinean village where one-year-old Emil Wamano, theoretical patient zero in the Ebola outbreak, died in December 2013 entirely behind the, black, the back of global, uh, global concern. In May 2014, Kailan, uh, as many of you know, became the first district in Sierra Leone to report Ebola fatalities. Penguia reportedly lost a doctor to Ebola in June. He was infected, we were told, by a nurse visiting from outside the community. So beginning in July, the Taya Peace Foundation, our not-for-profit social development entity, diverted monies away from social investment in agriculture toward enabling infection prevention and control measures via chiefdom authorities, chlorine supplies, protective medical gloves for four local health clinics, chlorine and other materials to establish 97 chiefdom-wide public wash stations and tools like bullhorns to help spread Ebola awareness and information after public gatherings had been banned. Taif Peace Foundation responded uh, to the outbreak early and urgently and in direct regular communication with community leaders and other representatives. According to multiple local, resources, uh, local sources, since that unfortunate doctor, no one else has died of Ebola in the community. 
Uh, currently, we continue to support Pinguia's infection prevention control measures, and we now, it, which now include chiefdom border control efforts, and we also fund seed for rice production to help address food security challenges, challenges and to uplift a local economy negatively impacted by the outbreak. We also, as well, undertake similar efforts now in Pinguia's western neighbor, Yahweh Chiefdom, where over 50 people have reportedly died of Ebola and 65 children have been orphaned. Taya Peace Foundation's expenditure to Pinguia from July to September, which enabled that community of 20,000 people to contain the outbreak, was around $10,000. Now, that, I've been told by uh, folks among the Ebola Survival Fund Coalition, which I, I formed with other groups active in the area, not to emphasize that, that, that figure, because uh, uh, much more is going to be needed to strengthen uh, health care delivery systems and strengthen infrastructure in the future. Uh, so I hope I said that with little emphasis. But I will emphasize this, that that $10,000 was essentially equivalent to the entire Kailan District Health Management Team's pre-Ebola epidemic outbreak budget of, according to the New York Times, uh, $10,500. That's, 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 that's for a district of 400,000 people. In, in December 2011, uh, one of uh, Taya's employees in Sierra Leone's northern Koinadugu district, the last area in Sierra Leone hit by Ebola, required emergency surgery to, uh, to repair a perforated ulcer. Taya Peace Foundation Executive Director uh, General Fred Lay and I happened to arrive in country just days after he'd been admitted to the regional hospital in Kabbalah, uh, Koinadugu's central town. So in visiting him, we learned that a group of American doctors had performed the surgery that saved his life. They told us that untreated, he would have died within 24 hours. He was fortunate those American doctors were there under a 10-day visit by International Surgical Health Initiative, uh, ISHI, a New York-based uh, uh, US-registered 501c3 that had deployed to Coinadugo for 10 days to perform mostly routine surgical pr procedures such as hernia repairs and cyst removals, but also, as it turned out, uh, uh, emergency procedures for four patients, uh, our employee being one of them. They operated on him under lights, powered by a generator, and hand-pumped oxygen into him, no oxygen tanks being available. In 2012, we engaged International Surgical Health Initiative to perform uh, a medical and surgical needs assessment of Kailan District's private Nixon Memorial Hospital, uh, Methodist Hospital, the nearest facility, nearest large facility serving Pinguia and its neighboring communities. Among other serious deficiencies, Ishii reported that the hospital was short of basic supplies utilized for daily patient care, including gauze and tape for wound dressings and, and, and catheters for administration of IV uh, fluids, anti-malarial me medications, and suture material. Hospital staff described the availability of only seven cloth gowns to be <clears throat> sterilized and reused for all aseptic purposes. The hospital's pipe score, which is an index used to assess surgical capacity, was two out of a possible 10. Ishi reps noted that Nixon Memorial's operating room was lighted intermittently, but by a car battery. This were a hospital serving 400,000 people, one of two in that district. My first visit to a, a Sierra Leone hospital was in uh, 2006, Freetown's uh, Konak Hospital, the, the country's main government hospital. And that was to see the old man who had initially invited us to work in Kailan District, Paramount Chief Saar, Francis Cabasse. Chief Cabasse had lived a long life, had fathered 28 children along the way, and, and died uh, shortly after we visited him of, of natural causes. But the hospital left much to be desired. So in, in, in August 2013, a task force established by the Minister, Ministry of Health and Sanitation presented a report to Sierra Leone President Ernest Bai Karoma on conditions at Connaught Hospital to come up with recommendations on a possible new model of governance and management of the facility. The task force identified seven areas that negative, negatively affected patient care at the hospital, including unsafe, insecure, worn out, and untidy hospital facilities, a high rate of hospital uh, acquired infections, limited range of services, delays in treating emergencies, lack of critical drugs, equipment and consumables, and unfair and unclear hospital charges and fees. President Karoma as well be bemoaned that uh, certain contracts were given for equipment uh, uh, to be used by a staff that was totally untrained uh, in, in that equipment and said that those who had, uh, who had uh, uh, worked uh, 
to uh, negotiate those contracts were, were acting uh, against the best interests of the people of Sierra Leone and were in fact heartless in his words. But why would local health care capacity be so weak prior to the outbreak in Sierra Leone when, uh, when the country and, 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 and the other countries as well received significant foreign aid? Indeed, Liberia, for example, received approximately $571 million of foreign aid in 2012, but only 3% went to national institutions, with a lion's share going to foreign NGOs and international organizations. Imagine you are the Minister of Health in Liberia, Guinea, or Sierra Leone, and the vast majority of your country's aid is bypassing your institutions. Your national plan is 90% unfunded, and the leading healthcare NGO in your country has a fully funded budget, triple yours. Imagine that you are responsible for the well-being of your people, and when a health crisis like Ebola hits, it's a hodgepodge of foreign agencies and NGOs which organize and implement your country's response. But they don't include long-term health system strengthening and infrastructure build-out as part of their mission. Imagine as well the temptation toward corruption when your ministry, like others in your country, is so woefully underfinanced. At a December 5th uh, UN uh, ECOSOS meeting, Sierra Leone Minister of Finance uh, Kaifala Mara explained that to that point, $712 million in Ebola response aid had been deployed to his country, but only 5% was, was channeled rather, to national systems. Former U.S. Secretary of State George Marshall was, was responsible for one of the greatest legacies of American uh, de uh, democracy and, and, and foreign policy intervention, the Marshall Plan, which rescued Europe from generations of dysfunction and infighting following its ultimate catastrophic collapse, World War II. The Marshall Plan was U.S. designed, but U.S. sponsored program that rehabilitated Western Europe in the form of loans made available directly to the governments of 17 nations. Announcing the plan in a speech at Harvard in 1947, Marshall declared, any assistance that this government may, may, may render in the future should provide a cure rather than a mere palliative. And it, he went on, it would be neither fitting nor efficacious for our government to undertake to draw up unilaterally a program designed to place Europe on its feet economically. That is the business of the Europeans. His thinking seems to deviate wildly from what is too often the international development strategy in Africa. Still, more than an opportunity for criticism, this uh, current Ebola crisis offers a, a chance for course correction away from business as usual and toward a transformational paradigm pivot. So what will be the legacy in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone once the work of the citizens of those countries and, 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 and that of those who bravely came to their assistance has achieved zero Ebola cases? When the foreign NGOs and agencies have moved on, what lasting good will have been generated? Will the regional health crisis looming in 2015 because of e Ebola exerted pressure on food security and the potential for resulting malnutrition to weaken effective uh, treatment when available of other common illnesses? Will that have been, been addressed? What of increased maternal and infant mortality rates, which now, after significant regional progress has been achieved, threaten to return again to among the highest levels in the world? Because now that the health uh, capacity is overburdened by, uh, recently by Ebola cases, where would a pregnant uh, woman go to find a safe, clean place to give birth to her child? Uh, what does she do if her baby is breached? Is there still a midwife alive in her village who can tend her? Will, will, will those 439 West African medical professionals, 439 who have died of Ebola, will they have been replaced? Will there be a training uh, uh, mechanisms and programs put in place to facilitate that in the long term? Will mechanisms and, uh, and development models have been established to harness the region's vast national, natural resource potential toward funding the maintenance of new healthcare systems and infrastructure. Young Emil Wamino lived and died 150 miles or so from a range of hills called Simandu, where is situated one of the largest untapped high-grade iron ore resources in the world. Over two billion tons of the stuff, representing multiple tens of billions of dollars of value, which in uh, the very recent past has been monetized. Uh, uh, but none of that uh, none of that monetization worked to increase the uh, availability 
of local uh, health care uh, uh, systems or health care that could protect that, uh, that young boy from uh, a ferocious, ferocious virus like Ebola. Now, to lessen the dependence on foreign aid, will that value, the value within Simindu's uh, iron ore deposit, uh, eventually be released along with that of the other regional mineral and agricultural resources toward generating tax revenues and social benefits that work to protect the well-being of local children like Emil in the future? Will new hospitals have been built? And if yes, at what cost? According to the International Business Times, the World Health Organization estimates that it takes roughly $5.7 million to set up and operate a 50-bed Ebola treatment center for six months in West Africa. In 2010, a coalition, including uh, the local Ministry of Health, the Clinton Health Access Initiative, Partners in Health, and Mass Design Group, built and equipped a permanent hospital in Butaro, Rwanda for $5 million, inclusive of rural East Africa's first cancer ward. Two summers ago, when I had the privilege of visiting Butaro with President Clinton and Dr. Farmer, my eyes were open to what is possible and necessary in Sierra Leone and, and, and broader West Africa, and that is modernity. As Liberian President Johnson Sirleaf has stated in regards to the Ebola response, military field hospitals would not be needed if adequate health care services were in place. Countries like Liberia need long-term investment to build up our health systems to prevent outbreaks of this scale from ever happening again. Now, many here in America reacted to the first U.S. Ebola case out of misplaced self-concern and an underappreciation for our country's privileged position relative to many within the global community. If a widespread outbreak could happen there, we thought it could happen here, an Ebola-fueled apocalypse coming straight to our shores from the African heart of darkness. But that proved untrue, of course. West African vulnerability to a major health crisis far exceeds our own. But weakness in the Mano River uh, uh, Union region, a predominantly moderate Muslim region, also weakens the United States and the rest of the world as well. So the international community uh, should continue to act now to contain Ebola at its source and for the long term. So let's partner with the leaders and the people of the region in doing that. Enable and not hinder them. Listen and act accordingly. We often speak of this part of Africa as suffering from a resource curse. But lately, I'm more inclined to think that it suffers from a Cassandra curse. The people of the region tell the world the truth about what they need and who they are, and we don't believe them. We ignore their, th their thinking and engage as we see fit. 68 years ago, George Marshall summed up America's coming development strategy with Western Europe in this way. And yet the whole world, the whole world of the future, hangs on a proper judgment. It hangs, I think, to a large extent on the realization of the American people of just what are the various dominant factors. What are the reactions of the European people? What are the justifications for those reactions? What are the sufferings? What is needed? What can best be done? What must be done? An historic opportunity to resurrect Marshall's vision for proper judgment exists today. Only now, finally, in West Africa. Thank you. The constituency for Africa, first of all, we want to thank Jeffrey Wright uh, for giving up his time and his thoughts on this uh, very important subject matter. We want to make a presentation to uh, Jeffrey Wright. Not a, you know, every day you can give this guy an award. I know he's waiting on the Academy Award and he got the Grammy and some of the other stuff already. So we'll see if they thought we would preempt him and make a presentation ourselves. So what we want to do is to make it right in front of the podium. I'm going to ask a couple of colleagues to join me. Raymond, why don't you join me? Julia, why don't you join me? Gloria Herndon, why don't you come down? Roscoe? Uh, recognition of your outstanding commitment to build public and private support for Africa. Thank you very much. You do it every day. I think you know.